My name is Frances Reynolds Brown Merritt, but you can call me Fanny. You don't see a marker here for me. Some people question whether I'm buried here at all. But I ask you, where else would I be except with my husband and four babies? My first husband was Coleman Brown. His body is left in a battlefield in Virginia. And Mom and Papa, they're right over there. The Bible says, blessed are those that mourn. It seems I've always dressed in black. But I remember a happy childhood with my sisters here in Covington. We had lots of farmland and lived in a pioneer house here in Covington. They later named the street Reynolds for Papa. The house has grown into a large, impressive White House. I, I think it's a funeral home now. When Coleman and I married in 1855, Father turned the house over to us and built a new one across the street. The next six years were the happiest in my life. Our son Walter was born the next year. And a few years later came the twins, Flossie and Hugh. The world changed in 1861. Our baby, Coleman Hugh, died before his second birthday. Then Georgia seceded from the Union, and Coleman enlisted. Papa was representing Newton County at the state capitol in Milledgeville, both in the legislature and later the Senate. He opposed the secession, but by 1861, the die was cast. Coleman was the first to die in our area. We received word in September 1862 of his death in Antietam. We held the funeral at the New Methodist Church. Not long after, that church would be filled with wounded soldiers. But I had no time for grieving, as our son Walter fell ill and died a few months later. It was the Christmas before his sixth year. Months later, my little Flossie would follow him in death. In seven years, I went from being a bride and a mother of three to a widow with no children. I was totally alone in the world. Such a sad time in my home and for our dear country. After four years of deep sorrow, a wonderful thing happened to me. I remarried Gustavus Merritt, who came here to practice medicine from Charleston. We later moved to Macon and had 15 wonderful years together before his death in 1883. I buried him here, beside our beautiful little daughter, five years old. Remember us as you pass our graves, or as you travel over Brown Street, or Reynolds Street, or Brown Bridge Road. May you be comforted when you mourn. My name is Martha Hood Dorset. I was born on February 27, 1818, and I died on June 20, 1838. As you can see, I was only 20 years old when I died. I would like to share with you a letter I composed in my head. To my loving children, Joe and Lizzie, I have asked my brother, Junius Hood, to pen my final words so that you might know who I was and who your family was. Me and your pa are both unable to read and write, so my brother's doing this. Life is hard in this new land, and I fear I shall soon succumb to the ravages of milk fever. The time I spent carrying you, Lizzie, has weakened my body, and I have a little reserve left to fight this malady. The neighbor lady who did the midwife and for bringing you into this cruel world has done everything in her power to get me shed of this fever, but nothing has helped me out. Your pa, Edmund, has gone to fetch the doctor, but it may be several days before he can get here. Your grandfather was Robert Hood. He was born in South Carolina in 1777. His family fled to Maryland to get away from the oppression of the British and the strife of the forthcoming battles for the War of Independence. My mother was Elizabeth Harrison Hood. Lizzie, you are her namesake. My mom and papa got married in South Carolina in 1806. There weren't much said about Mama's family, and I do not understand why she never talked about them. Every time I would ask her, she'd just shun off the questions. Papa was a different story. He would tell us tales about his kin. His father was Andrew Hood, who was born in Virginia in 1746 after his family immigrated from a land far away. Papa says there was a Dutch German who came to New York State from Holland. Your papa will outlive me by a good 20 years. His family held from the same areas my family held from, Maryland, Virginia, and the Carolinas, but he won't speak freely about his kin. Most I can figure is there is hard feelings around his home. His papa seen a fella stealing from the store and told the man who owned the store about it. 
Harsh words were spoke about your grandpa Darcy and threats was made against his life. He had a bad case of the wonderless anyhow, so he left them pots and settled across the corners of Newton, Jasper, and Morgan counties. There's a community over between Madison and Social Circle named Darcy for him. I know Joe Papa and he come a sparking me. We fell in love and got married. It was a mess trying to figure out where to get our marriage license. Your papa was from outside of Newburn and we was from Broughton. Newton County was being formed on the borders of three counties at the time. Edmund and his brother Hezekiah on land in all three counties, but we finally figured out we was from Newton. We had to go over to Brickstore to get our marriage license. We got married on February 26, 1834. We have lived all over these counties. Joel, you was born down in Kellytown at your Uncle Hezekiah's farm in 1836. Your papa moved us up to Gum Creek to live with my brother and his new wife. Mama and papa had a hankering to move further west since old Hickory Jackson, the president, has kicked them Indians off their lands. Your papa is afraid of the government and refuses to let them find us to answer the census taker. Lizzie, I fear I will not live to see you take your first steps. The fever is working hard on me, and I think I will be with my Heavenly Father soon. I give you these words so that you may pass them on to your children when they question you about your ancestors. If I do not survive, I have told your pa to remarry quickly and find a good woman to take care of you. Greetings in the name of the Lord. I am Andrew Hamill. I was born the year John Adams was elected our second president, 1796. There were few churches around here at that time. We were living on the frontier and very few people had ever even heard a sermon preached inside a church. The bishops of the Methodist church were concerned about bringing the word of Jesus Christ to the frontier settlers and to the slaves and to the Indians. They began ordaining circuit riders such as myself to go out and preach the gospel to the unconverted. We would get on horseback and preach wherever there were a few people to hear it. We would preach every day of the week, except for Monday, which for us was a day of Sabbath rest to replenish our souls. We had 25 or 26 stations on a circuit, and we would preach to each one of them twice a month. One historian wrote, they preached like no one else, often exerting, exhorting and, and stamping and screaming and always encouraging. We would uh, eat twice a day whenever somebody would feed us. We would sleep wherever they would house us, sometimes on a dirt floor in a drafty and cold cabin. We were paid in those days about $60 a year. <laughs> I guess you can imagine that in those days, almost all Methodist preachers were single men. Well, I was ordained and set off fervently to serve the Lord at the age of 20 years old. For the remaining 19 years of my life, I preached as far east as Washington, Georgia, as far west as Columbus, as far south as Savannah and Brunswick, and as far north as the upper French Broad River. In 1833, when I was 37 years old, I was fortunate enough to marry Miss Maria Torrance of Baldwin County. And for the remaining two years of my life, I enjoyed some of the comforts of home life. But nothing was as important to me as bringing the message to the slaves on the rice and cotton plantations. That was a very dangerous appointment. Many pastors died of malaria or cholera or any of the other diseases that were rampant on the plantations there. I served that mission from 1833 to 1834 when I was the presiding elder of the Savannah District. Maybe that was when my health began to fail, or maybe it was from all of the years of the hard riding on the circuit. In 1835, I returned here to preach in Covington and Madison and Athens, and I thank God that he brought me back here to die. I was able to see that the churches in Covington were growing, and by that time, that congregation had moved over to a new location on the corner of Washington and Lee Streets. Later that same year, my wife buried me here in this peaceful little cemetery. At that time, it was called the Methodist Cemetery, but as the church continued to grow and prosper, they built another church over on Conyers Street. And in 1860, they sold this cemetery to the city and it became known, known as the City Cemetery. If you're wondering why I'm buried here all alone, my lovely wife went on to marry Judge William A. Cobb and lived to an old age in Upson County.
I'm Patriot Robert Pullum, a handful of American patriots buried in Newton County. When I was a young man, I served under General Marquis de Lafayette and General Anthony Wayne. I was born in New Jersey in 1756 and later in life moved to Loudoun County, Virginia. In Virginia, I served with the Virginia Militia. And while I was home, after serving in the Virginia Militia, General Lafayette was in the area and came right by my house, said General Cornwallis and his army is in the area. Are you willing to take up arms one more time and serve in the militia to fight General Cornwallis, who we feel is in full retreat after his loss at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse in North Carolina. Well, being a young patriot, absolutely. The states had a tremendous debt to pay off the cost of the war. And so states, in order to provide benefit to those who serve to bring us the nation of free people we are today, offered land grants. And as land was ceded, such as in Ohio or Georgia, uh, from Native Americans, and in Georgia, land was ceded at that time, around 1790, by not only the Cherokee Nation, but the Creek Nation, places like Greene County opened up for land grants. And lo and behold, I was a recipient of a land grant for my service as a patriot during the American Revolution. And in Greene County, I farmed and raised a family and lived there for many, many years. And my oldest son, Althea, and his wife, Louisa, lived there in Green County, but later on, land opened up further west in Newton County. And my son, Louisa, and the family moved here to Newton County. And I stayed in Green County as long as I could, but as I got older, I came to live with my oldest son and his family here in Newton County. And in July 1854, at 98 years of age, I passed on and was buried here in the Newton County Historical Cemetery, which I am honored to know that Newton County was named for a great American patriot. Sergeant John Newton, who served in the 2nd Continental Regiment of South Carolina, commanded by Colonel Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox, was noted in American history as a group of patriots were about to be executed by the British guards. Sergeant Newton overran the British guards, saved the patriot lives, and went down in American history as one of its great patriots. I am James Philip Sims. For those of you who like dates, I was born on January 16, 1837, and died a little over 50 years later on May 30th, 1887. My two brothers, two sisters and I, grew up in a white house on Floyd Street, just east of the First Baptist Church. And I married the beautiful Mary Lou Bates, whose family grew up on Monticello Street, right across from the First Methodist Church. My brother, Richard Lee Sims, was born two years after me, but was killed in the war between the states in 1862 at the Battle of South Mountain. My youngest brother, Arthur Benjamin Sims, we called him Benny, was captured by the Union forces, but later lived and later practiced law with me here in Covington. Some folks refer to me as General Sims. I was initially a major, but was promoted to colonel in 1862 of the Army of the Confederacy. I led the men of the 53rd Georgia at the Battle of Fredericksburg in Virginia and the Battle of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. I was promoted to Brigadier General in December of 1864 and led my brigade until I was captured at the Battle of Sailor Creek, Virginia on April 6, 1865. After the war ended, on April 9, 1865, three days after the Battle of Sailor Creek, I was released from a northern prison in Fort Warren, Massachusetts. The war between the states was a terrible conflict and laid a mighty hardship on many of us here in Covington. 
I had the unpleasant duty of reporting to my mother the death of our brother Richard. After the war, I returned to Covington, whereby my brother Benny and I led a very successful law practice in a building just west of my home on Floyd Street, which is now a part of the First Baptist Church. I represented Newton County in the state legislature in 1865, 1866, and once again in 1877. In May of 1887, I died and was buried here. My younger brother Benny died just 22 days after me and was buried alongside me. My wife Lucy was buried next to me upon her death in 1889. Good evening, I am Dr. Francis Marion Cheney, and I was born on March 9th of 1821 and resided in the portion of Newton County, which is now the Brick Store community, the eastern portion of Newton County. I moved with my father Enoch to Texas, and there I consecrated my life to the Redeemer and became a Baptist preacher. We didn't stay in Texas for long. We moved back to Newton County and settled in the, I had a plantation in the Mansfield area, and my neighbors were the Burges and the Graves, which are much more famous than I was. Dolly and her daughter Sadie once turned over on their cart, and by that time I had become a doctor. So they didn't break any bones, and later on in life I tended to Dolly's stepdaughter Lou when she had cholera, and as she lay dying it was quite helpful that I was both a minister and a doctor. You might say, since I was also a farmer, that I was what today would be called a Renaissance man. What I am most famous for, however, is my famous expectorant. Do you know what an expectorant is? Well, it cures all kinds of common colds, bronchitis, and the croup. It is 18% alcohol and has morphine in it as well. And Aza Candler, local Coca-Cola magnate at the time, said he and his family would not go to sleep at night without a bottle of my expectorant on their mantle. I later died suddenly at age 53 of a heart attack. I did have at one time a home in what is now the East Haven community and a drugstore on the north end of the square. So after my death, my son sold my expectorant to the B. Daniel Drug Company in Atlanta and it was marketed in the southeast until 1937. My name is Julia Ann McCracken Camp Porter. My first husband was Charles Camp. He was a merchant in Covington, Georgia. In 1859, he purchased one half interest in the shares of the textile mills at Cedar Shoals. Mr. Camp and I had one child, a daughter. Her name was Charles, but she was called Miss Charlie by everyone. Charles, when he returned from that dreadful war between the states was, well, he had injuries from which, unfortunately, he, he never recovered. My second husband, Oliver S. Porter, was born in Penfield, Georgia, where two generations of Porters had served as trustees on the board of Old Mercer University. Oliver, when he returned from the war, was hired in a position as a teacher in Covington, Georgia, where he soon met Mr. Enoch Stedman. Now, at that time, Mr. Stedman owned the uh, mills at Cedar Shoals, and it wasn't long before Mr. Stedman hired Oliver, who was such a sharp man, to work as his bookkeeper there at the mills. This was Oliver's first job in textiles. I married Oliver Porter in 1869. With this marriage, Mr. Porter became guardian of Miss Charlie and along with me inherited the uh, shares of the mill that my first husband Charles had purchased. So in 1871, we moved to Cedar Shoals and a beautiful antebellum home that, that Olive had built for us. We called it Cedar Shoals Place. Now, Porterdale, when it became Porterdale Mills, the village itself took the name Porterdale, but we always still called our home Cedar Shoals Place. Oliver and I had three sons. John, who was a supervisor of Porterdale Village. James, who, like his father, held an interest in the mills. And O.W., who ran the company store. So you see, it was quite a family enterprise. We also had two daughters, Mary Erin, who died when she was only 14, and uh, of course, our lovely Miss Charlie. 
In 1890, Oliver sold 810 of our acres to the mills for a total price of $50,000. I told you he was a sharp man. Oliver also served as one of the original commissioners that founded the Georgia Institute of Technology, an office he filled until his death on June 16, 1914. On October 25, 1925, Bishop Warren Candler, who helped found Emory University, gave the dedication ceremony for the Julia A. Porter Methodist Church in Porterdale. Well, my son James had given quite a bit of money and asked that the church be named for me in return. <laughs> I even shoveled the first dirt that started the construction of that building. I understand that it's still standing today. Welcome everyone, come a little closer and listen to my story. My name is Richard Mills Everett and I was born in Screevens County, Georgia in 1823. A short time later, my family and I moved just south a little bit to Jasper County into Monticello. And that was where I learned about death and loss. You know, I had nine brothers and sisters, but only five of them lived to be adults. And at the tender age of four, I lost my mama and my daddy. And that was when we had to be busted up and bound out. It was a sad time then because it was me and my older sister, Margaret, that went to live with the John Spears family. Well, you know, Mr. Spears got $100 by the state of Georgia to help raise me, but he had to give his word that I'd get at least 18 months of schooling to learn a trade. Well, Mr. Spears lived up to his, to his word. I did learn a trade. I learned how to do uh, harness making and, and also make saddles. Time went on and my oldest sister, Margaret, married James Spears, son of Mr. Spears. And, and when they did and my indentureship was up, I went to live with them. And you know, it was a good thing I did because that's where I met my sweet Eliza. We had 11 children. Well, short time after that, we decided to move to Henry County. And that's where I opened up a, a buggy and, and harness shop there. And I was also the justice of the peace. And I served as trustee to the Mount Carmel Methodist Church for the longest time. Time went on and our business prospered. And during the war of the Northern Aggression, we were able to supply the Confederate government with goods and supplies. After that, in 1870, we moved to Covington and I bought a house over on Clark Street, right over there on the corner of where Cowan and Cowan Appliance Store is right now. And I opened up my shop a little bit further down the road on, on Depot Road but that's now called Emory Street. Well, I decided to move the shop a little closer to home after that, and uh, we again prospered. I had a, a very good life. I had a long life, and I served the Lord well while I was there at the First Methodist Church. A matter of fact, there's a joke going around, and it, uh, it goes like this. Well, you can tell that Mr. Everett attends church a lot because he just about wore out his cane walking the floor. Well, that's how often I went to church. Things were better and better. We decided to expand our business. We started making furniture and caskets, providing funeral services. Well, we even sold eggs, milk, and produce. And we sometimes fed the patrons down there at the Flowers Hotel, just right down the road. You know, one day I got in trouble at church. There was a Chinese man that was renting one of my stores and I decided to take him to church because he wanted to go. Well. Folks didn't cotton to that very well. And uh, I was actually brought before the congregation and tried for bringing him to church. But with the good Lord's help, I was acquitted. And I continued to serve the Lord in that church in spite of that. I told you one time earlier that I had 11 children. I'm especially proud of one son I have. His name is Richard Eugene. And he pretty much took after me. He continued to grow the business and expand it and take special interest in it. And he was uh, also a prominent member of the First Methodist Church. He started singing in the choir when he was 12 years old. Not only that, but he served two terms as the mayor of Covington. A few more years passed on, and in 1910, I passed away. And when uh, I was buried, my longtime friend, Bishop Warren Kendall, the president and chancellor of Emory University, spoke at my grave and during my funeral service. 
And I was real honored by that. And speaking of that, my, my dear Eliza passed away. She preceded me 20 years earlier, and she lays right here beside me. Well, that's about all of my story, such as it was, but before everybody leaves, I need to ask a question. I know that some of you people came from far away, but I didn't see any buggies. I didn't see any horses. How in the world do y'all get around? Hi there, my name is Mary Louise Fowler, or you can just call me Miss Louise like my students used to. I was born in 1907, right here in Covington. When I was eight years old, I found a tennis racket that fell off the back of a truck. I got me a ball and some chicken wire, and I pulled the chicken wire across the road to make me a net so I could play tennis. That was kind of inconvenient though, because every time a car came by, I would have to move my net. But that was the beginning of my love for tennis. My father was so impressed with my dedication to the game of tennis that he built me a real tennis court in our backyard where we lived in Covington, right on the corner of Clark and Emory Street. I graduated from Agnes Scott to make my mother happy. Then I went on to the University of Georgia and got a degree in physical education and a master's in science to make me happy. I taught physical education, tumbling and tap, first in the schools and then in my own studio in Covington. In the spring and the summer, I played competitive tennis. They used to say that I hit the ball like a man because in those days there was very few women that played tennis, so I really did hit the ball like a man. I won many titles throughout the Southeast and then on through the nation. I was ranked sixth in the South and then by 1941, I was ranked number one in doubles. My partner and I won six straight titles in the Georgia State Open and then in 1958, I swept the North Carolina state tournament in Asheville, North Carolina by winning the singles, the doubles, and the mixed doubles. After my cancer surgery that forced my retirement, I started the Fowler Tennis Club by adding another tennis court and a clubhouse in my backyard so I could teach the youth tennis. Although I was an honorary member of the United States Professional Tennis Association and a member of the Georgia Sports Hall of Fame and a member of the Georgia Tennis Hall of Fame, the early 60s to the 1975 was my most rewarding time of my life when I taught the youth of Newton County the game of tennis. Now, how about a tennis lesson? Here are the rules. It cost $1 per lesson with unlimited court time except during church hours. There will be no profanity and no display of angers on my court. You will treat your fellow players and your opponents with respect. Always remember to do your very best and you will never have anything to be ashamed of. Always be courteous and win or lose graciously. Those were the days I can hear the balls hitting the court, hitting the fence. I can hear the chatter of my students in the clubhouse talking about all their matches. It was like we were one great big family. I can remember loading up students and taking them all across the South to tennis tournaments in my own car at my own expense. We took so many titles. We had trophies. We were ranked in the South. We were ranked in Georgia. But you know, it really didn't matter to me what level of play my students were. The most important thing were the life lessons that they learned while they were on my courts, such as fair play. That's what counted in life. I lost my battle to cancer the last day of 1979, but that's not the end of my story. I still have students today that are teaching their next generation and then the next generation the game of tennis and good life lessons. My name is Dr. Luke Robinson. I was born in 1869, four years after the war between the states. All my young life, I saw hard times, hungry times, and suffering times. I saw many Confederate soldiers, many with amputated limbs and other injuries. That's when I decided to dedicate my life to helping others. My home here in Covington was an early 1800s raised cottage located where the high rise now stands on Washington Street. The formal boxwoods and flower gardens where Peacock's Room were always welcome to my guests. 
Many of my patients who could not afford my services offered to pay with chickens, baked goods, or canned vegetables, which I greatly appreciated. And if I delivered a baby boy and the mother named him Luke, there was no charge. My horse's name was Hurry, as it seemed every time I jumped into the buggy to set a broken leg or a bloody wound, I would snap the reins and shout, Hurry! Two of my proudest moments were being elected president of the Georgia Medical Board and serving the people of the city of Covington on the Covington City Council from 1909 to 1916. I died in 1938 at Emory University Hospital of blood poisoning after being spurred or pecked by a rooster while I was on a house call. The Methodist Church was overflowing with mourners. The governor of Georgia, Eugene Tamage, was one of my pallbearers. Five of my six children are buried in this historic cemetery. The words inscribed on my tombstone best describe my life. Others, Lord, yes, others, let this my motto be. Let me live for others that I may live like thee. My name is William Henry Odom, Jr. Most of my friends just call me Junior, and this is my story. I was born at home in 1916 over on Emory Street. My daddy, William Henry Odom Sr., served as mayor in Covington, 1920-1921, and mama, her name was Mamie Osborne, was poet laureate of Newton County. Somehow I managed to have five sisters and no brothers. As a young'un, I helped out on granddad's farm. It was one of the oldest Jersey cow farms in the country, raising registered Jersey cattle and champion bulls. Every morning, I delivered glass bottled milk by horse-drawn wagon to folks around Covington. I met my wife, Eloise Luke, while she was attending Oxford College, and we raised three children. Did you know that my great-granddaughters are the actresses Dakota and Ellie Fanning? Well, eventually I moved my family to the farm, and most of my adult life I sold milk to seal test and provided the community with vegetables. I love Tennessee walking horses and quarter horses, and heck, we even held rodeos with professional livestock and real rodeo clowns. I could often be seen driving my horse-drawn Surrey in local parades. I was also a big supporter of local sports. When Ron Bradley led the Newton Rams to an unprecedented 129 consecutive wins in basketball, I caravaned to the team just about every away game. And at home games, you could always spot me near the West Goal in Death Valley Gym. To get the youngins involved in baseball, I built a ball field on my property. I made sure those kids were well fed too. But I'm probably best known for my work in law enforcement. I served as chief of police and deputy sheriff before being elected sheriff of Newton County in 1964. <laughs> Things were sure different then. Back in 1964, there were two deputies, a jailer, and myself. I had a car, and they shared another one. My wife helped out in the office. Our filing cabinet was often our shirt pockets. There wasn't all the record keeping that there is now. We worked a day shift and then we were on call after that, but we never worked more than 24 hours in one day. Instead of chasing drug dealers, we were chasing moonshiners. Homicides were rare, but it was up to us to solve it. And it just wasn't anybody else. We knew everybody in town. And if a crime was committed, somebody tipped us off and we'd have them locked up pretty quick. Of course, those were also the days of desegregation in the civil rights movement. Intentions ran high at times, and we had to deal with that too. I had a reputation of being tough, but fair, which made me well-liked by some and not so well-liked by others. But every story has an ending. For me, it was February 24th, 1976, during my third term as sheriff. One of the Newton County chairmen said that my heart was bigger than a 10-gallon hat, but it just gave out. After my funeral service, one of my favorite horses, saddled but without a rider, led the hearse that carried me to my final resting place. Only 59 years, but I tried to make the most of them. By the time I had died, Newton County was growing and so was crime. I think I had 19 employees in the Sheriff's Department in 1976. Now I hear there's somewhere in there 300. Good evening, my name is Olden Bohannon. I was born in the southern part of Newton County in 1897. My family and I lived down on the Old Waters Place. We owned a farm, it was 2,200 acres. It was one of the largest farms in the, in, in the whole county. The Central Georgia Power Company, 
who you now know as Georgia Power Company, bought 520 acres from us to help build Lake Jackson. They were building the dam real near where we lived and my brother and I went out there and watched them almost every day. They built that dam with nothing but mules and carts. There were no bulldozers in those days. They did it all by hand. They started the dam in 1908 and finished it in 1910. They built a bridge across Lake Jackson. They called it Waters Bridge and because I'd been hanging around the construction site for so long, they let me be the first person to go across it. I went across, I rode across it on my old gray mule and we were going across that bridge and that mule was looking down at the, through the slats at that ground so far away because there wasn't any water in the lake then. And that mule, I'm telling you, was scared. And really, I was probably a little bit scared too. Anyway, they finished the dam in 1910 and started putting water in it. Around April of 1911, the lake was pretty much full. There were an awful lot of critters in there. There were frogs, millions and millions of frogs. Unfortunately, there were millions and millions of mosquitoes too. And by September of 1911, we had a full-fledged malaria epidemic down there. It killed a lot of old people and a lot of little kids. Lot, most of the people, they're just up and left. They just abandoned their homes and abandoned their crops and lost everything they had out there in the field. We moved too. We, we went up to a farm right up here uh, near where the herd mixing school is and stayed there for a year. And then my mama bought a 50 acre farm in Conyers and we worked that land for three years. By 1915, the epidemic was pretty much over and we've moved back down. Things were calm, but they didn't stay calm for too long. In 1921, the boll weevil hit Newton County. Now we knew the boll weevil was coming. Everybody knew it was coming, but we just didn't understand how bad it was gonna be. We lost over 70% of our cotton crop. The poison to kill the boll weevil cost way more than the price of the cotton. So there was nothing you could do except just watch them eat you out of house and home. It was terrible. The entire economy of Newton County was devastated. The only good news in this is that the automobile business in Detroit was booming. And there was a huge labor shortage. So a lot of folks from Newton County went up there. 30 or 40 people went up there. My wife and I were two of them. We went up there and worked for the Department of Transportation. I stayed there for seven years, but my friend Harold Nash went ahead and stayed there forever. He just went ahead and retired and, and, and retired to Detroit City. My first two children were born there. Olin and Judith were born there. Dr. Judy Greer was born there. Her daddy came home though after her mama died. He moved on back home here. During the uh, uh, seven years we were there, things were great, but then the depression hit and we thought it'd be better just to move on back home. So we came home and we'd open up a little store in the Stewart community. It's right down there. It's where the Hendersons is, right at the intersection there. You've all been there and seen that. So we ran that store for 13 years and then closed it down. And then we went ahead and moved to Covington. In those days, it was a long way from Hendersons to here. And now you can just do it in a car, but it was a long way. So we moved back to Covington and I took a job with the Bibb Manufacturing Company and I stayed there for 15 or 16 years. I had a little glass walled office right in the tool shop there and they were doing all the tool work around me and I was sitting in that little glass walled office doing cost accounting. And I retired from there and lived out the rest of my life here in Newton County and I died in 1982. Welcome brothers and sisters. I am the Reverend Tony Baker, born in 1837, property of Jess L. Baker, who was sheriff of Newton County from the early to mid 1800s. My mother's name was Isabel. I was born free. I was taught to read and write very early, which was something that most young folk in my race did not have the chance to express. But later when I became a teen, the good people at Oxford College paid for me to further my education in Augusta, Georgia, at the Springfield College, which later became Morehouse College in Atlanta. I met and married the beautiful Adeline Anderson of Starsville. The Lord bless us to have six beautiful children, Sarah, John, Robert, Fletcher, Georgia, and Lavinia. Lavinia attended, yes, yeah, Spelman College. But Adeline and I had many good years together. We worked together in ministry and in life. But later, Adeline got sick and she passed. But the Lord allowed me after her death to, to meet and marry Aura Reynolds. Now, Aura worked for the John Stevenson family in the big white house on the corner of Clark Street and Emory Street. She worked and worked hard. And one day, Aura had a heart attack and died at work. I was saddened and, and I'm alone again. And I wondered what I would do, but God is good. But let me take you back in, in time now. 
uh, to my earlier days. Growing up amid slavery, life was almost unbearable for many of us. And we needed a worship experience in God that would help us have solace in our soul and give us hope for life after death. There were many white churches that allowed blacks to have worship in the gallery area. But we needed an experience that was unique to us, that would speak through our statement of pain where we could worship in our own way. So in 1849, I was about 12 years old. The Reverend Barry Fish called together the first meeting of a black church in his home. We met and we grew. We met and we grew. We met and we grew. And then we decided we'll build us a little church. So we built a, a log hut near the Georgia Railroad Depot. And Reverend Fish stayed with us to 1850. And then we renamed the church the Bethlehem Baptist Church. We were blessed with a wooden frame church in 1856 by White Fellowship. And that's where the church is standing now. And I was called by God to preach. And I became the first pastor of the Bethlehem Baptist Church. And we had a custom in our community. We had services on the second and fourth Sundays of each month. That custom maintained in Bethlehem until 1959 when we went to four Sundays. But I was privileged to preach and to serve. Not only did I preach and serve in Bethlehem for 46 years, but I also preached and pastored the Rock Creek Church for 15 years and the Shady Grove Church for 35 years and the Union Baptist Church for 10 years. All in all, I preached God's Word for 56 years. My prayer and my faith is that I had rendered service that God was pleased with. And at 71, I was laid to rest. Praise be to God. Thanks be to Bethlehem Church. And thanks be to the Covington area. You all be blessed and be pleased to serve Him. Come on in, y'all. I've been waiting on you. Folks told me that you were going to stop by to come and visit with me for a little while. I heard that you all wanted to stop by because you wanted to hear more about my life. Imagine that. Me, Diana Watts Pace. You want to know about my story. My story began not here in Covington, Georgia, in Athens, Georgia, 1853. I was born a slave to the Alexander family. And after the Civil War, you know, people always did say that I was very keen and I had a keen insight for things. And I felt very passionately. And I tell you, oh, I had a love of children. And I left my hometown, Athens, Georgia, and I traveled on to Atlanta, Georgia, where I decided that I would get me an education and be trained and become a teacher. And I did just that. I attended the Atlanta University Normal School, and in 1833, I graduated from there. Yeah, I spent a little time in Atlanta. I began going about the neighborhood of Summer Hill. You ever heard of that neighborhood? That neighborhood is located just on the other side of what today is now known as a Turner Field. And I worked and gathered up all the neighborhood children there, and I began a Sunday school founded the Mount Pleasant Sunday School. Now I did that along with Mr. Casey, another very civil-minded civic -minded young man. Myself, him, and my two brothers. There was Lester and Albert. Now Lester himself was a Pullman boarder on the train, and he helped me financially be able to do this work. And he, my husband, Mr. Casey, and my two younger brothers, we began to sow the seeds of Christianity all throughout that Atlanta neighborhood for many years to come. Then when I was about 20 years old, I moved to Covington, Georgia to teach school in churches and in private schools. In 1884, I took in two little orphan colored boys into my home. And then from there, the next thing I knew, people all over town thought of us and our home as a woman who kept house for lonely and homeless children. And before you knew it, our home was so full of children, we had more children than we had rooms. And so with the collective work of all of us, so you see, I educated and trained these little young people. I trained them in a way that they had strict moral values and they had a work ethic that you just wouldn't believe today. 
I trained them. So they were able to go out and we made money and we pulled our money together and we were able to buy a home. There was a lady by the name of A.C. Reed and she saw the work that I was doing here and she sent me a thousand dollars. With that thousand dollars in 1880, I opened the Covington Colored Orphanage, later known as the Reed House and Industrial School. Almost single-handedly, before I died at the age of 80, I educated and trained over 700 boys and girls to go out in this world and make something proud of themselves. Traces of my children can be found all over the United States where they have gone and done something very successful with their lives. It was over 465 girls and 200 and 65 boys that lived in my home as orphans that I bought in out of the cold and angry streets and bought them in and gave them a home and taught them so that they would be something someday, that they would in fact make something out of their lives. My sister, Anna Mae Watts, carried on my work after my death. And you know, the folks in Covington they built and named a road after me, the Diana Watts Pace Road. Now, the orphanage no longer exists there today, but that road is there and it is a testament for me, Diana Watts Pace, a woman of Christian courage and a woman who really stood out there to make a difference for children during my time. My name is George Thompson. I was buried here on Tuesday, July 27, 1937. I was 55 years old and left a widow, Annie Thompson, who was buried here many years later. An account of my death was carried on the 29th July edition, 1937, of the Covington News. According to this account, I, as chief of a tribe of Indians from the Cherokee Nation, led my group to an encampment at Clark's Grove, west of town here in Covington, where we stayed for several days. On the night of uh, July 25th, there was an automobile in the ditch near Clark's Grove. Members of my group offered assistance in pushing the vehicle out of the ditch, but two local men came to assist and ordered us away. One of them even fired a pistol over our head. After the auto had been freed and was on its way, the two men followed us back to our encampment, and one of them fired into a group near some children. I ran to pick up a child and was shot by that man. I was taken to Houston's Memorial Hospital, uh, local private hospital on North Emory Street and I died there later that, that evening. On July 27th my funeral was held here and J.C. Harwell and, and sons acted as funeral directors. After my body was lowered into the grave sheets of metal were placed over the casket and members of my group poured grape juice into the grave and gave words in our language and threw small handfuls of dirt on the grave. Then the Reverend Walker Combs of the First Baptist Church of Covington pronounced the benediction my group was interviewed by the Covington News and they expressed their appreciation to the local citizens who had befriended them and stated that they had no hard feelings for what had occurred. I understand that the man who fired the pistol was later indicted, tried, and found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. That is the story of my death according to the official newspaper. Local tradition, however, has it that I was the leader of a group of gypsies and that there were hard feelings between us and some local people. We were in Clark's Grove and in the evening by our campfires it was no unusual event to engage in a friendly game of poker. On the evening prior to this occasion we were joined by some local citizens. One of the gentlemen lost a considerable sum. He returned on the evening in question to settle the score. The settlement resulted in my death. I'm Mahalia Clark. My friends remember me as Titi. When I died in 1955, I lived right there on Carnia Street in Harristown. My life here on Earth lasted 100 years, and I saw a lot of changes in that 100 years. Our country elected 20 presidents in my lifetime. 
Franklin Pierce was president when I was born in 1855, and General Eisenhower was in the White House when I died. I was born a slave and was just six when I heard tell of Mr. Abraham Lincoln had been elected. He tried to keep this country together, but that was more than any one human being could do. It took an awful bloody war to save our nation. I was just a little girl of eight, but I still remember the excitement among our people as the word spread about the Emancipation Proclamation. Yes, I lived through some hard times, through slavery, through that terrible war, and the hard scramble times of Reconstruction. I lived through the Great Depression and four more wars we sent American boys off to be in. I outlived two fine husbands, first Pitts, then Clark. Then I lost my precious daughter, Ada, in 1906, when I was in my 50s. Still, I had a lot of wonderful friends and good neighbors on this earth. I especially remember my friend, Essie Bagby, Minnie Gwynn, and Dorothy Wyatt, who were just like my sisters. Sometimes I took in boarders, and I loved watching children grow up around me in Harristown and in my church. A lot of my time was spent serving God in my church, St. Paul AME Church on Stone Mountain Street. I was a young woman when it was started in 1878, and I remember it burning down to the ground, not once, but twice. Later, I was able to buy a piano for the new church, as well as a lovely marble top table in our vestibule. The table is still there. It was our first piano, and sound of that music gave me a lot of joy. The piano is on loan to the Masonic Lodge on Geiger Street. I was nearing the end of my life at age 99, when another great moment in history for African Americans came about. In May of that year, the Supreme Court ruled on a case called Brown versus Board of Education. It said, all of the schools in our country must desegregate. Of course, that was just the beginning and it was years before all civil rights would be granted. But I knew when I died that change and a better time was coming. My name is Alberta Josephine Hendricks Williams, and I was born right here in Covington, Georgia on Hendricks Circle, which is named for my family. My parents were Jesse and Eugenia Hendricks, and my sister Sadie and my brothers Philip and Tommy Lewis are buried right here with me in this cemetery. Also, my father's brother William is here too, and they called him Babe. And I guess that many of our other family and friends from our community are buried here in this cemetery. A lot of African Americans from across the community. But back then, their graves were marked with a wooden cross or a plant. And in later years, many families have been able to afford headstones, and some have even had stones with their family members' names carved in them. But I guess you didn't come to hear so much about them. You really want to know something more about me. My headstone says that I was born in 1891, but people didn't keep very good records back then. And I graduated from the old Washington Street School in Covington, which burned down in 1939. After graduation, I went to Atlanta to attend Clark College for normal school. And in case you don't know what normal school is, is the education that one received when they were becoming a teacher. I was married in Atlanta, and we lived in the city until the Great Depression. And my husband had to move to Montgomery, Alabama to find work. We had five children, four daughters and one son, Mary, Charlie, Nanny, Jesse, and Matthew. After we moved back to Covington, I did whatever I had to to keep my family together, working as a domestic, sometimes selling insurance, but I did what I had to to make sure our family stayed together and our children were fed. I was blessed through our children because our children moved to several different parts of the country and they produced for me many grandchildren, which brought me great joy. 
I take great pride in being a lifelong member of the Grace United Methodist Church over on Washington Street, which was started right after the war between the states. Even though I worked in a segregated society, I tried to do what I could to teach the children of my community, and I enjoyed that my whole life long. I finally retired from lifelong teaching on September 1st, 1960. But my retirement didn't last very long. I died on October 1st, 1960. My retirement only lasted one month. I died at my home at 612 Hendricks Circle, right up from the West Side Cemetery in my beloved Sand Hill community.